Hi, this is Margaret from Civic Nebraska's Voting Rights Team, and today we're going to be talking about the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, I do have a guest who will be joining us later in the call. We have John, John Cartier. He is the Director of Voting Rights at Civic Nebraska and a specialist in constitutional law. So before the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1788, the 13 states compromising the Continental Congress were held together by the Articles of Confederation. The Articles remained in place until 10 years after the end of the Revolutionary War. Under the Articles, the federal government had very little power. Each state sought to further its own ambitions and reaching consensus was difficult. In 1787, the Confederation Congress met to redraw the Articles. Instead, they scrapped them entirely and started over. Disagreements, though, soon arose between states with large populations and those with small populations as to the number of representatives in Congress each state should receive. The Virginia plan put forth by the Federalists would consist of one Congress with the number of representatives determined by each state's population. New Jersey's proposed plan was championed by the Anti-Federalists and would give each state an equal number of representatives to Congress. And my apologies to anyone who lives in New Jersey. I've been there, you have lovely beaches. Uh, we picked on you solely because it was your plan. Roger Sherman, the only person to have signed all four of the United States' great state documents, was serving as the representative for Connecticut. He proposed what has become known as the Great Compromise. His plan entailed a bicameral legislature that would incorporate both New Jersey and Virginia's plans. Further disagreement arose, however, in how to determine each state's population. In 1787, slavery was still legal in roughly half of the states. The delegates from states where slavery was not legal did not want enslaved people counted towards elected representation. Southern states encouraged counting enslaved people towards their elected representation while simultaneously denying voting rights to those same people. Neither side advocated that voting rights extend to anyone other than white property owning men. Representatives agreed to a compromise, which became Article II, Section 1 of the Constitution, which states, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians who are not taxed and three-fifths of all other persons. So that's the compromise they developed so that slave, enslaved people partially counted towards representation. Article 2, Section 9 protected the international slave trade for 20 years from federal prohibition. On September 17, 1787, the Constitution began the ratification process. Nine states would be required to sign the Constitution for it to become law. The nation was evenly divided in support and opposition to the Constitution. The Anti-Federalists remained steadfast in their opposition to a large, centralized federal government. A Bill of Rights consisting of 12 amendments was added to address Anti-Federalist concerns. Despite these additions, the road to ratification was still not smooth. Each state held its own convention for ratification, yet even in Philadelphia, one of the first states to ratify the Constitution, some anti-federalist representatives were dragged from their boarding houses and locked in the Pennsylvania State House to complete the process. On June 21, 1788, New Hampshire became the ninth state to ratify the Constitution. The Constitution took effect on March 4, 1789. So we've been asking all our guests who join us uh, to answer the question, what does voting mean to you? So today we're going to have John Cartier, our Director of Voting Rights, uh, talk to us a little bit about what voting means to him. John, what does voting mean to you? So meeting, or excuse me, voting means to me, it's a long, complicated struggle for equality, 
and rights and the promises that were guaranteed to all mankind in the Constitution, also Declaration of Independence. As Margaret noted in the very beginning, the only people who could vote were white land-owning males, and it took hundreds of years to get to the point where we are today. I mean, it wasn't even until the 70s where the 26th Amendment was ratified, allowing people over the age of 21 to vote. So realistically, when we're looking back in our history, it's only been relatively a short time since we've been able to see people of all ages, all colors, all genders participate in this process that is so incredibly important to the way that we all live our lives. And it is a long, long struggle. And it is, quite frankly, it's not over yet. And it's not going to be over any time soon. And I think the other thing to talk about voting, I mean, it's a personal thing. In my life, I became really interested in the political process, especially voting and how we choose our representatives following the recession that happened in 2008. It was really devastating for my family and it was very apparent that it was a construct of a system that was set up by people that we put into positions of power and who were not being very good stewards of the way that we you know, buy homes, we, we go to jobs and stuff like that. So really voting, what it means to me, it means just about everything in a sense that it's the only way we're going to make real effective changes for our family and for our friends and for everybody in this country and to live in a future um, that's going to uh, realize the dream um, more, um, more uh, articulately stated by Martin Luther King Jr. And um, I think that's what voting means to me. Well, thank you, John. I think it's important, as you noted, that it's it's an ongoing struggle. It's it's not something that we can sit idly by and look at the past and feel comfortable that it will always be here because we do see constantly attacks and erosions on our voting rights. If you feel That's passionate right. about voting like John, you don't have to make it a career as John did. Uh, <laughs> you can also uh, help to protect voting rights from the safety of your own home right now during this period of time when we are trying to uh, socially isolate from one another. Uh, we have what is our outreach circle. It's an online platform for people to engage in different activities to help promote voting and you can select which ones you're interested in and very easy to do. You can use your smartphone and scan the QR code on your screen or you can visit the link that is listed there as well. And we'd love to have you join our team at Civic Nebraska Voting Rights. Thank you for joining me today, John. No problem. Uh, and before we end, I, I do have a quote uh, that's pretty interesting uh, to, to end out here. This, this was a, a letter that came from John Adams. And although he was a staunch abolitionist in our uh, beginning history of our country, he was one of the founding fathers, just like the rest of them, who really didn't think that everyone should have an equal vote, equal voice in government. And in a letter, he responded to a question asking about, well, what should we, are we going to allow other people to vote besides just us? And his answer was, it is dangerous to open so fruitful a source of controversy and altercation as would be opened by attempting to alter the qualification of voters. There will be no end of it. New claims will arise. Women will demand a vote. Lads from 12 to 21 will think their rights not enough attended to. And every man who has not a, a farthering will demand an equal voice with any other all-access state. That's a really fancy way for him saying that once people realize who they are and the rights that are guaranteed to them by natural law or maybe some other divine idea of, of uh, someone watching out over us, it's, it's something that there will be no end of it and we're going to keep making sure that everybody is going to have a voice and be able to participate no matter who you are. And thanks, Margaret. Thanks for joining me, John. And thank you all for watching.